So yes, it's true, today is my birthday, and it is uh, a milestone birthday, 50 years. And because it's a special birthday, uh, I have uh, the privilege of having uh, my son and my daughter here. Uh, our son drove down from New Hampshire. Our daughter flew up from Lynchburg, Virginia. They're sitting in the back row. Great to have you guys uh, with us today. <laughs> And yesterday, I was able to be on a, a Zoom call with a number of close friends and other family members who couldn't be here, uh, knew that today would be a busy day, so I had a chance to interact with them. That was wonderful. And today, I get to celebrate my birthday with 60-plus of my close church family members. And, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do that if it was just a social gathering. I think 15 or whatever is the total. But coming to church, I can celebrate with 60 of you or more. Well, that's great. Hey, I want to encourage you at this point uh, to find the sermon outline in your bulletin and uh, to take that out, use it as a guide today. We're going to be continuing our study of the book of Philippians. We're in chapter 4, so you can open up your Bibles uh, to that portion of Scripture as well. Have you ever been in a position where you knew you had to have a difficult conversation with someone, but you tried to avoid it? because you feared that you might offend them or because you thought that what you had to say might be taken the wrong way. Uh, most of us tend to avoid conflicts at all costs. Uh, we don't want to potentially escalate the problem by confronting the other person directly. So we don't say anything. We keep the matter to ourselves. No confrontation. No conflict, right? Christians tend to have this ideal, uh, idealistic view of the relationships that we have with uh, one another in the church. We, we think that since we're all living by the Bible, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're obeying the command to love one another, there won't be any conflicts among us. But such idealism is not realistic, whether in a church or in a Christian family. It's been said, to live above with the saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to live below with the saints we know, well, that's another story. And for many, my many years of uh, serving as a pastor, there are two things that I know to be true. Number one, Conflicts among Christians are inevitable. And number two, resolving conflicts is hard work. We just can't simply avoid having these difficult, sometimes awkward conversations. Well, this week we will be introduced to a new main section within Paul's letter to the Philippians. Uh, in this section, which is chapter 4, verses 2 through 9, Paul briefly touches on a number of concerns that he has related to the church, and he exhorts the believers there to live in the ways that God has commanded. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to take a look at each of these concerns that Paul has related to the church at Philippi. And Paul, uh, Paul's first concern is addressed in verses 2 and 3, uh, the, the verses that Charlie read for us just uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, there was an obvious problem in the church at Philippi. There was a conflict between two women in that church, two women by the name of Yodia and Syntyche. Comprehending the nature of the problem is a bit of a challenge for us for a couple of reasons. First of all, neither of these women are mentioned anywhere else in Scripture. And secondly, Paul does not provide any specific details as to what the dispute was about. However, in our own historical setting, we unfortunately are quite acquainted with conflict within the body of Christ. So we can speculate as to what may have been the cause of their disagreement. It may have been 
a personality conflict. Um, we know what that's like. Um, we are part of a church with other believers, but sometimes another Christian just tends to rub you the wrong way. Uh, and maybe you get annoyed by their idiosyncrasies. Maybe that you think they talk too much or they're too emotional or they exhibit bad hygiene, whatever. But because you're annoyed with them, you tend to be impatient with them when you're around them. And so that leads to conflict. Maybe the disagreement was over a difference of opinion. Again, we know what this is like. Um, maybe we don't agree with how another person in the church is doing something. Maybe their approach to completing a task isn't the way that you would have done it. Maybe you think they're being ineffective in the way that they're trying to resolve a problem. Um, in terms of uh, difference of opinion. Here's a good example. Maybe we ask a couple women in our church to work together to decorate the auditorium uh, for holidays and for uh, change of seasons. And uh, so it's Christmas time and one of the women thinks, you know, we should put a Christmas tree on uh, both ends of the stage and light it up. And the other one's like, no, I, I think we should do a manger scene. And one of them wants to put wreaths up on the, the walls. And the other was like, no, I think we should put uh, sayings that have to do with Chris, Christmas on it. I think that's what we should do. And they just can't agree. And uh, they have a difference of opinion. But maybe that leads to conflict. Maybe the disagreement was because of a power struggle. A power struggle. Um, sometimes we see that, that one person covets a position that another person has within the church and out of jealousy towards that person uh, it, there's, a, there's a conflict there. Uh, maybe uh, you learn that the, the church is looking for a new worship leader and you're interested in holding that position and the leadership talks to different people, holds an audition, and decides to go with another person. You're welcome to be on the worship team, but you're not the one who's asked to be the worship leader. And you have to work with that person that you think, I could do a better job than them. That could lead to a power struggle. Uh, maybe the disagreement was due to a personal offense something that one person says or does toward another person that is hurtful or unkind. Maybe, it was, uh, maybe it's a verbal attack. You get angry with somebody and you just spout out at them. You, you tell them what you really think. You call them names. You demean them. You exaggerate their shortcomings. Uh, you, you say things that you later regret. Maybe you say or do things toward that person that communicates very clearly to them and everybody else that they're not welcomed and they're not wanted. Maybe uh, you try to, uh, or maybe, whether it's intentional or unintentional, that you've embarrassed that person publicly through a put-down uh, or something that was said. Those are ways that we can offend others in the church. Another way is by judging or criticizing someone else without first having all the facts. And uh, that happened to my parents uh, a number of years ago. Uh, we were attending a church together many, many years ago, and they had another couple in the church that they were really close to. And then there was an incident between this couple's daughter and my parents. And this couple listened to their daughter believed everything that their daughter said and basically pulled away from my parents without ever asking them their side of the story or even attempting to work with them to, fig, you know, to try to resolve the issue. They just sided with their daughter and pulled away and their relationship with my parents has never been the same. And the problem with you know, offenses is that 
the, the, the offense itself can lead to conflict, but then what happens afterwards can also escalate the conflict. For example, once an offense has been committed, uh, if the person who committed the offense is approached, they may be unwilling to admit that they did anything wrong. Or the person who was offended may be unwilling to forgive the person that hurt them. And so we see that, that um, conflict happens within the local church. And it can happen for a number of reasons. It was happening in the church at Philippi. It was a problem. And so Paul goes on in these next two verses to try to provide a solution to the problem. And he talks about how to resolve interpersonal conflict within the local church. And he talks about three things that I believe uh, were uh, instructional to the church in Philippi and to Yodia and Syntyche, but it's also relevant to us today, and we should take notice. So this is what Paul has to say. He says, number one, take personal responsibility to resolve the conflict. Uh, we see that in verse 2. Paul says, I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. So Paul pleads with Yodia and Syntyche to work things out between the two of them. Um, we don't know much at all, really, about Yodia and Syntyche, but apparently they were prominent church members. From what Paul says in the next verse, which we're going to look at in a few minutes, they obviously had been very active members of the church. And it's possible, even though we can't know for sure, that they both were saved when Paul first visited Philippi and met with the women who had gathered by the river outside of the city to pray. We saw that in the very first week in our series of Philippians when we looked at Acts chapter 16, that that's what Paul did. And these women, Yodia and Syntyche, may have been a part of that original group. And if they were, they would have been two of the original charter members of the church. And they would have been women of significant prominence and influence. And Paul says to them, I plead with you, Yodia, I plead with you, Syntyche. The word plead means to urge or to beg or to entreat. And so Paul urges, he begs, he entreats both Yodia and Syntyche to resolve their differences because both women shared equal blame for their disruptive con con conduct. But he says, I plead with you, Yodia and Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. What, what, what does he mean by that? Well, to be of the same mind means to live together in agreement and harmony. Paul is saying to these two women, despite your differences, make a commitment to live in agreement with one another and to live in harmony with one another. But he also says to do this in the Lord. And what I think Paul means by that, he's saying, to, as you live in submission to the Lord, Jesus Christ, live in agreement and in harmony with one another. And so what I think Paul is saying here is this. He's saying, Yodia and Syntyche, because of your common union in the Lord Jesus Christ, and because of your need to submit to Jesus as the Lord of your life, choose to live in harmony with one another. Refuse to remain in conflict. So Jesus is the common denominator here who will establish true unity between these two women if they would but commit to doing things his way. Now, there are different ways that cr Christians can choose to respond to interpersonal conflict. And some are unhealthy responses, and at least one that I'm going to present is a healthy biblical response. 
One option would be to avoid the other person and get others to side with you in the conflict. So when one is in conflict with another person, it makes them feel a whole lot better to think that more people believe that they're right than those who agree with their opponent. And one common sin is for the one who feels wrong, wronged to talk to many others about the person who wronged them rather than going to that person directly. Now, it's fine to go to a, a, a mature spiritual leader of the church, someone who can be trusted to keep confidence in order to gain their wisdom on how to approach the person who wronged you. But it's not okay to talk to several others. This is gossip or slander, and it just compounds the problem. Another option would be to leave and to find another church. Because, of we, because we live in a day and time where there are a number of local churches in close proximity to one another, it's easy for Christians to just hop from one church to another when things aren't going their way at the church that they've been a part of. And at times, I wish that that wasn't always the case because then we wouldn't take the easy way out and miss the growth and the good testimony that can come through sticking around and working things out in a biblical manner. A third option is to seek reconciliation with the other person. And I suggest that of the three that I've presented here, that this is the only appropriate biblical response. God's word tells us that if you become aware that you have sinned against another believer, you are to seek out their forgiveness. We see that, for example, in Matthew chapter 3, verses 23 to 25. Let me read that for you. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 to 25, part of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says to his disciples, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. I've always found these verses to be very fascinating because what Jesus is saying here is there's something more important to God than formal acts of worship. It's unity within the family of God. And so he's saying if you've come to gather for worship and you know that you have wronged somebody else, then leave your gift there. Leave your offering at the temple and go and reconcile with that person, then come back and offer your gift. And so he's stressing the importance of unity and the need to go and seek forgiveness from the one that you've offended. Uh, there's another side to this as well. Jesus also tells us in the Gospels that if another believer has sinned against you, then you are to lovingly confront them we see that in a couple passages of Scripture. Uh, for example, Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Jesus says, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. And I think uh, this isn't limited to uh, a sin against the person who's going to confront them. Uh, the, you could just be aware that they've sinned in a way that um, could hinder their relationship with God, that is hurtful to other people, could hinder the testimony of the church, and you go and talk to them about it. But it certainly includes the idea that they may have sinned against you personally as well. Another verse is Luke chapter 17, verse 3, uh, where Jesus says these words, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, 
forgive them. And so in, re in resolving conflicts, we are never to be passive, waiting for the other person to apologize or to change. In each of the verses that we've just looked at, it's incumbent upon you, believer, to take the initiative to go to your brother or sister to clear up the problem between you. And the best solution for resolving differences is to solve the problem between yourselves. This is rarely easy, but it's always the right thing to do. It's the Christian way. It's the biblical way. But what if the believers who are in conflict are unwilling or unable to work things out between them? Well, that's where Paul goes on to his second exhortation. He says to enlist other church members to help resolve the conflict. We see that at the beginning of verse 3. He says, yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women. Paul asks his true companion to help these two women sort out their differences. Evidently, a third party was needed to reconcile them. Now, who is this true companion that uh, Paul refers to here? Well, despite numerous guesses, no one knows for sure who the true companion was. Some have suggested Timothy or Epaphroditus or Luke. Others have suggested that maybe it was a leading elder or another pastor in the church who was designated to read Paul's letter. A popular view today is that we are to leave the Greek term untranslated and take it as a proper name. And if this interpretation is correct, then Paul was referring to a man by the name of Susagos, which means yoke fellow or true companion. But I seem to think that Paul is using the singular term true companion in a collective sense to refer to the Philippian church as a whole. He's saying, I believe, you, the local church in Philippi, you are my true companion. And I'm encouraging, I'm exhorting all of you to help Yodia and Syntyche resolve their differences. I believe in Paul's mind, the entire church was to help these two women live in harmony with each other. And as members of the church, it is the responsibility of every believer to maintain unity within the local church, to maintain the unity of the spirit. So don't let fear of meddling keep you from seeking to reconcile other believers who are in conflict. Because there is a difference between meddling and seeking to do gospel-centered reconciliation. So how can a local church help its members reconcile their differences? Let me give you just three very practical suggestions here. Number one, be objective. Be objective. Did you notice that Paul didn't take sides here? Or imply that one woman, one woman was right and the other was wrong? And if we are to help reconcile the relationship between two believers in conflict, we must be willing to hear both sides before making any judgments about who is most at fault. So let me give you another example. Maybe there's a couple people who are working in the nursery. And uh, uh, in this situation, there's actually a number of infants and toddlers who are cared for in the nursery during uh, Sunday morning worship service. And so both of the team members, the nursery workers, are needed. But for the last three weeks, one of the nursery workers has been coming late, three weeks in a row. And the one who's coming on time is expressing her frustration pretty uh, openly and vocally about 
the displeasure of this other person keep arriving late, and now you've been brought into it. Well, it, as you're hearing the one person kind of go off, part of you might be thinking, I get it. This other person's being irresponsible and insensitive and uh, you know, needs to get their act together. But maybe you should take the opportunity to hear from their perspective of why they've been late. And it's very possible that they have a legitimate reason each week. Maybe the first week their battery died and they needed to have, a, be, have it jump-started in order to get to church. And that's what made them late. The second week they were walking out the door and they got a very important phone call from a family member that they had to address even though they tried to keep it brief. And then the third week, they're on their way and they have a massive headache and they don't have any Tylenol in their, in their purse and so they stop at the store to get it so they could function when they got there. And if you heard that side of the story, you may say, okay, you would, that's, it's unlikely that three weeks in a row these types of things would happen, but that's what seems to have occurred in this case and I get it. And you can now you know, help them because you're being objective to work through the conflict. Um, now, speaking from experience, it does get a bit sticky when both sides are saying contradictory things and neither party will admit to lying. And when that happens, about all you, about all you can do is kind of like you can't deal with what happened in the past because you just don't know. But what you can do is deal with and address the wrong attitudes and words and actions that you perceive in the present and, and address those, confront them about those. But still, be as objective as possible to both sides. Second, be open, direct, and truthful. Open, direct, and truthful. C can you imagine how these two women felt when Paul's letter was publicly read in the assembly. He's going through this letter, like three chapters, talking about his love for the church and exhorting them in different ways, reminding them of what uh, Christ has done for them. And all of a sudden he says, and I plead with Yodia and Syntyche to be of one mind in the Lord. And I could just picture them kind of like, shrinking down in their chair and looking around and what an embarrassing moment and here we are 2,000 years later and these two women are known primarily for one thing this quarrel that they had with one another but notice that Paul doesn't beat around the bush he named names and sometimes we are so careful to tiptoe around so as not to offend anyone that we end up being vague and confusing. Paul didn't drop hints. He was direct, specific, and truthful. Third, be affirming and positive where possible. Again, notice Paul didn't scold or berate these women. And as we will see in a minute, he affirmed them and expressed appreciation for their ministry. So likewise, when seeking to help other believers who are in conflict, we should look to build them up rather than tear them down. Now, the third thing that Paul has to say here about resolving conflict in the local church is this. Understand why resolving conflict is absolutely necessary for the well-being of the church. In uh, the second half of verse 3, uh, Paul says this, uh, Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose name are in the book of life. Paul reveals his heart for these two women here who are in conflict, and he explains to the Philippians why the church must help them to reconcile. The first reason is because this conflict distracts from the church's gospel-oriented mission. 
Yodia and Syntyche had been partners with Paul in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement, uh, some man who's not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture, but he was evidently known to the Philippians. Maybe he was uh, another member of their church. But Yodia and Syntyche had partnered with Paul, they had partnered with Clement, and they had partnered with Paul's other co-workers in the work of the gospel. But what appears to have happened is that when this conflict began, Yodia and Syntyche discontinued ministering or serving in the ways that they had before because Paul says, help these women since they have contended at my side. And I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting that to mean, but they're not right now. They have but they're not any longer. And so this is so important to understand that, that as Christians, we have to work at resolving conflict so that the church can focus, keep its focus on where it needs to be, not on conflict and resolving conflict within our own walls and among our own people, but we can focus on the work of the gospel. Lord Nelson, one of Britain's greatest naval heroes in the late 18th century, once came on deck and found two of his officers quarreling. And he whirled them around and pointed to the enemy ships and exclaimed, Gentlemen, there are your enemies. And we need to remember that the enemy is out there. He's Satan, the prince of darkness who wants nothing more than to divide God's people into quarreling factions so that lost people do not hear the good news of salvation. Quarreling church members are not witnessing church members. And so we need to avoid quarreling at all costs. A second reason why, um, we abs why resolving conflict is absolutely necessary is because it creates disunity within the church. Paul has made a general appeal for unity several times already in this letter. Look back with me at chapter 1, verse 9. He says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Based on the context here, I believe he's talking about your love for one another. He's praying that the believers in Philippi, that their love for one another would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Look at verse 27 of chapter 1. He says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. And then in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Paul says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. You see the emphasis on unity within the local church in these verses. And these two women who had fought side by side for the gospel now fought against each other, contrary to the gospel. And as I thought about this, I, I was wondering how in the world can two Christians who have been serving the Lord together get to the point that they can no longer stand each other? How does that happen? And the answer is that they lost focus as to what is truly important. That's what happened. The tragic conflict between Yodia and Syntyche reveals that even the most mature, faithful, and committed Christians can become so selfish as to be entangled in controversy if they are not diligent to maintain unity. The unity of the church 
should always take precedence over petty differences between believers. At the end of verse 3, Paul hints at what our mindset and attitude should be towards other people in the church who are involved in conflict. In referring to Yodia and Syntyche and Clement and these other co-workers, he says all of their names are written in the book of life. Um, the book of life is a record of those people who belong to God. There's a, a passage of scripture that make this, makes this so clear. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Um, the apostle John was given a marvelous revelation of what's going to happen at the end of time. And here we're told of the judgment of the dead. And this is what John tells us about this vision that he had. He says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the death and death in Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This is a judgment not of believers, but of those who have rejected Jesus Christ their entire life, and they die in that rejection. And we're told that in the last days, Jesus himself will sit upon the throne, and he will judge those and who have rejected him all of their lives. And we're told in this passage that there's a record of those who have believed in Jesus and have put their faith in him, and their names are put in the Lamb's book of life. And if their name is in it, it means you belong to Jesus, and you will escape that final judgment. But if your name is not in that book, then you will be judged according to the wicked things that you have done, and you will be separated from God for all eternity and cast into the lake of fire. But here, in this context, the emphasis is positive. He's talking about this conflict between Yodia and Syntyche. He's talking about the need of the church to help them to reconcile. And basically what he's saying is this. He's saying you need to help them reconcile because Jesus Christ died for them just as much as he died for you. They are sisters in Christ. And so you need to demonstrate your love and your concern for them and for the health of God's church, the, 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 the members of God's family, by helping them resolve their differences. And so the main point here, I believe, for us, is that we need to be willing to help believers who are in conflict because they are brothers and sisters for whom Christ died. Um, dis disagreements among Christians, it's not new. Um, we obviously see this disagreement between Yodia and Syntyche 2,000 years ago. It was happening before that, and it's happened since. But mature Christians do not allow these differences to interfere with unity in the body of Christ or the mission that Jesus has given us to make more and better disciples. So friends, are there broken or wounded relationships in your life that you need to deal with? Are there other believers whom you see to be at odds with each other that you need to help reconcile? At Perryville Bible Church, we encourage difficult, sometimes awkward conversations to take place. If you're going to have real relationships with other believers, there will be conflicts from time to time. So plan on having these 
Yodia and Syntyche conversations for the good of the church and for the glory of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for uh, our time together this morning around your word. Again, we just see how practical the scriptures are to our lives. Um, to take a situation that we are very familiar with today, conflict between believers in the local church, and to receive very specific instructions from you through Paul on how to address uh, interpersonal conflicts in the church. So Lord, uh, my prayer this morning is that each one of us uh, would reflect on our own lives to see if there's anybody that we are personally in conflict and that we would seek to reconcile with that individual if need be. Um, but also, Lord, that uh, we would take a look at our church uh, collectively and s to evaluate the health of our church as a corporate body. And if we are aware of others in the church who are at conflict, that we would commit ourselves to helping them love in a loving way, in an encouraging way, in an uplifting way to settle their differences. May we do that again for the health of the church, but ultimately for the glory of God. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.